You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. City of Ash Flat kicks off parade season. Miniature horse, pipe organ and great music delight the large crowd. By Lauren Siebert. Ash Flat held their annual Christmas parade on December 3 along Ash Flat Drive. The parade lineup began at Forschler Home Center and ended on Main Street in downtown. In the week of preparation before the parade, some problems were encountered, according to Nancy Orr, organizer of this year's parade. We had put up the lights on a Sunday, and for some reason they wouldn't work, or said, thankfully we finally got them up and going. The team was very busy in the days prior to the parade. We picked up the cookies, set up the tables, got the platters, or said, we had coffee, the sale bar made hot chocolate, and Geraldine Evans made hot cider. Meacham's restaurant made six dozen cookies and some brownies too, for us to pass out. We had a stand in front of Mr. and Mrs. Raby's Main Street print store on Main Street. Families lined both sides of the road, eagerly waiting to see the floats of the parade some in lawn chairs, some stood, while others sat down on the tailgates of their cars and trucks. The parade lasted for a little over a half an hour and the streets were covered in candy and children racing to collect it. The Highland High School marching band waited at the livestock auction sale barn to join and march. I thought they did an excellent job, or said, we're always proud to have them they just make the parade. While some parades encourage competition between the entries, the Ash Flat Parade is held just for entertainment and to celebrate Christmas. We don't have a theme and we don't have judges, or said, we just do it for the fun of it. With so many creative and unique floats, or mentioned a few of her favorites. We had some good floats, I especially liked the one with the Salem cheerleaders all dressed as angels, or said, I also liked the Sale Barnes, with Santa and his boots stuck out of the chimney. Becky Foreman and her miniature horse Sugar Baby, of the Little Buckaroo's miniature horse ranch in Ash Flat, also joined the parade. I love the parade, we look forward to it every year, Foreman said, we wear matching tree skirts every year. After marching in the parade, Santa set up in front of the Ash Flat post office, and handed out bags with oranges, apples, and candy to the children. After all was said and done, or was happy with how the parade turned out. We spent so much money, but when you see those little kids smiling, and so happy it is all worth it, or said, we want to thank everybody that helped. The ones that came and participated and all the people that worked and puts it on, and served the food it was just great. You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. Hardy City Hall back in action. Offices relocated, mayor still keeping options open for a drier, safer location. By Lauren Siebert. Since the disastrous flooding earlier this year at the end of April, Hardy City Hall has been occupying the Hardy Gym when the flood threatened the City Hall building located at 124 Woodland Hills Road. As of November 30, the Hardy City offices have relocated back to the original City Hall building. According to Mayor Nina Thornton, the move back took two solid days, and they are still getting settled in. We're open for business we're not up to par yet, but you can pay your bills and find out about a few things, Mayor Thornton said. We moved the Tuesday and Wednesday the week after Thanksgiving. Although every city hall office is not yet fully in place, Mayor Thornton says they will all be settled in very soon. We moved room by room, and put furniture back as it went. All stuff is in front of whichever and whoever's office it belongs in, Thornton explained. Due to the lack of volunteers, the city hired individuals to help with the move. I'm sorry to say we had no volunteers, we hired it done. Our three employees, the ladies, that work here we boxed everything and we used our cars and our trucks and trailers, Mayor Thornton said, we had to hire five men, to move the furniture and heavier things. Mayor Thornton would like to thank Sharp Office Supply for their help as well. Sharp Office Supply let us borrow some dollies to move the furniture and stuff, Mayor Thornton said, we are really thankful for that, it really helped a lot and we appreciate everything they do for us. All procedures were followed during the move, to protect city records and for the police department areas, that needed to be kept secure at all times. I took care of the computer chain, our city computers were never out of my sight, Thornton said, adding that the police department was kept secure as well. The evidence has to be locked up, completely secure at all times and only certain people can move it, Mayor Thornton said, the fire department moved the evidence room, which completed the move of the police department on November 29. One concern of the mayor is still the possibility of flooding, and precautionary measures have been taken to help protect the contents of City Hall in the event of another flood. 
When I think about that flood from before, it makes me a nervous wreck, Mayor Thornton said. Our insurance for contents was at $30,000 but I have up that to $100,000, Thornton continued. When I priced the cost of new office furniture and cabinets, what we paid $250 or so when we had originally bought it, it is now at close to $4,500. Mayor Thornton noted that although FEMA has provided funding to move City Hall in the past, they will do so only if a state of emergency has been declared and are only able as long as funds are available to them. It is a possibility that there could be no money for the next disaster, Mayor Thornton said. Now that the City of Hardy offices are back at City Hall, Mayor Thornton says she is still exploring other options for the future. We love this building, it's nice and clean, and the floors are wonderful. Each one of us has our own really nice office, and we had this remodeled from wall to wall, Thornton said, but because of the location and constant threat of floods during the rainy season, we are still looking, Thornton concluded, we are looking for a permanent home on higher ground. You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. Police respond to shotgun threat. Officer draws gun, man states he is too busy to put his hands up because he is on the phone. By Lauren Siebert. Sharp County officers were dispatched to White Horse Mountain Road near Cherokee Village on November 29 after a call was placed to 911 at approximately 7.20 p.m., stating that Marvin Brown, 32, was in possession of a sawed-off shotgun and was threatening to shoot people. Officers responded from all departments, but before officers arrived on the scene they were advised that Brown had left the home as a passenger in a vehicle, and then jumped out of the vehicle and taken off running. Highland Police Officer Shane Russell was traveling down Griffin Road when dispatch advised him that Brown was now traveling on foot. After reaching the residence on White Horse Mountain Road, Officer Russell stated he had traveled about a half mile and spotted Brown in the middle of the road ahead facing him. When Officer Russell saw Brown he came to a stop, exited his vehicle, took precautionary measures, and drew his gun. At that point I was unsure if Mr. Brown was still armed, Officer Russell said. After Officer Russell instructed Brown to show him his hands, Brown replied that he was on the phone. When Officer Russell told Brown a second time, Brown did as he was told, at which point Officer Russell then instructed Brown to step in front of his vehicle and put his hands on the car. According to Officer Russell, Brown was compliant but had to be given instructions repeatedly. Each time he would do what he was told, but then he would take his hands off the car so I detained him. Smelling alcohol on Brown's breath, Officer Russell proceeded to ask Brown where he had been. Mr. Brown told me he was just standing in the road using the phone. I asked him again where he had been, and he asked if he was under arrest, Officer Russell stated. At that time Officer Russell said Brown was not under arrest but he was being detained until the matter had been sorted out. Brown proceeded to ask why. I told him we had gotten a call about him with a shotgun, threatening to shoot everyone, Officer Russell said. Officer Russell then asked Brown if he was going to cooperate. Brown stated he wanted to talk with his lawyer. As Officer Russell began transporting Brown to the Sharp County Jail, he noted that Brown began to hit his head against the cage inside the car several times saying oops you did it again, according to Russell. Brown was charged with disorderly conduct, drinking in public, and obstruction of governmental operations. You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. Alleged truck thief confesses. Cooperation over state line leads to recovery and arrest the next day. By Lauren Siebert. A stolen 2008 Ford F-250 was recovered on December 2 at 3.30 p.m. near a Casey's convenience store in Thayer, Mo, after it was reported on December 1 to have been stolen from Jim's Auto Sales in Hardy, sometime after closing November 30. Cooperative police work between the two departments has often been the key to solving a case. Recently, in October, a theft at Hirsch's farm supply in Thayer was solved after Hardy Police Chief Ernie Rose spotted the suspect vehicle in Hardy after a bolo beyond the lookout alert from the Thayer Police. In this case, Chief Ernie Rose put out a statewide bolo and, after Sharp County Chief Deputy David Huffmaster spotted the vehicle and identified the suspect, it was Missouri's Oregon County Sheriff George Underwood, who was able to hold the suspect on a Missouri charge. We helped them solve their case a while back and got the guy who was at Hirsch, Chief Rose said, so they kind of helped us out on this one, cooperation between departments can sometimes make a difference. Chief Rose was first notified of this theft on the morning of December 1 by Wesley Miller at Jim's Auto, who noticed the truck was missing when he arrived at work that morning. After checking to see if the truck might have been moved to his father's car lot, he was informed the vehicle was not there either, and he then contacted the Hardy police. 
When Hardy Police Chief Ernie Rose arrived, he noticed a window had been broken on the east side of the building, and the window was open three to four inches. The blinds had also been opened on a north window, possibly to let light in to locate the keys hanging on the east wall, without turning on the lights. Miller told Chief Rose he found the keys in disarray, not like he left them the night before, but that only the keys to that specific truck were missing. Miller also stated that, even though there were several other items of value in the office, nothing else had been disturbed. Trooper Jeremy Connor assisted Chief Rose in filing the statewide bolo, which was entered into the NCIC system by the Sharp County Sheriff's Office. At the same time, while Sharp County Deputy David Huffmaster was passing through there, he spotted the tan 2008 Ford F-250 in a vacant parking lot next to Casey's, and spoke with a witness, who helped lead to the identification of the operator of the stolen vehicle, Cody Ty McCann. After Oregon County Sheriff George Underwood advised the operator, McCann, of his constitutional rights, McCann signed the Miranda Rights form, and confessed to stealing the truck from Hardy, Ark. On December 1, further stating that he and a friend planned the trip to Hardy to steal the truck, and that he would pay his friend $2,000 for the truck, when they got back to Missouri. The accomplice will remain unnamed, as the case is still under investigation. He's being investigated, until we do our own investigation we don't know if it is true, Chief Rose said. McCann was charged in Missouri, with tampering with a motor vehicle in the first degree, a Class C felony with a $10,000 bond. As Missouri held McCann on their charge, Chief Rose had time to file for a warrant, before McCann was able to bond out. McCann is on the hold until he can be extradited to the Sharp County Sheriff's Department. If he had been in Arkansas we could have incarcerated him on the spot, Chief Rose said, but, because he was in Missouri we had to get our warrant issued and served before he bonded out. A warrant for arrest was issued in Sharp County, charging potential defendant McCann with theft of property, a Class C felony. Because he crossed state lines, he made things worse on himself, Chief Rose said, now he has to stand in court in Missouri and Arkansas on felony charges. You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. Oscar Wilde play in the works. Students to put on classic Oscar Wilde play, The Importance of Being Earnest by Lauren Siebert Highland High School will be performing their Christmas play, The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde, on December 16 at 7 p.m., followed by a second performance next day, also at 7 p.m., and a final show at 2 p.m. on December 8. There will be a $2 entry fee, to help with production costs. Written in 1895, the play is about two young men, that have told a lie, as director Shona Joy Covington puts it. This lie is that they have told the women they love is that their name is Ernest, Covington said. These women love these men on the surface, because they have both always wanted to marry a man named Ernest. When these men fall in love they have to reveal the truth of their identity, and then you get into the conflict and the comedy of trying to have their names changed to actually being Ernest. HHS always performs a musical in the spring, however, Covington decided to try something a little different this semester. I decided we need to do something this fall that was a little more scholarly, Covington said, so we are attempting to do a classic, and we are doing a beautiful job with it. Covington said she thought it would be a good challenge for the students. The script is as hard as learning something Shakespeare has written, Covington said, there are long speeches and they are rising to the challenge and doing really good. Cast member Gregory Self stated that, although the musical students had performed in the past had been difficult, the play presented a new type of challenge for himself and other cast members. It's a very different tempo, and sometimes it feels like you have to discern the difference, Self said, pointing out the differences he noticed between a musical and a play. In a musical the music is your guide, Self noted, you have to pay a lot more attention to the play. It's not as blatantly obvious, especially in Oscar Wilde's work. Sarah Shackelford said she was new to the stage but was eager to perform. I've never done a play before and I thought it would be really fun, Shackelford said, it has been everything I'd hoped it would be a little nerve-wracking, but it's fun. Performing plays for HHS is an extracurricular activity and, although the students do not receive credit, they do receive valuable experience. We've been working very hard on this, and we have learned a lot, Maddie Tayer Smith said. Cast member Darren Vesperus represented the cast in his explanation of what each had gained from the production. Each one of us will have a different story to tell about how we've come along and how this play has put us in different situations, Vesperus said. I think we are pretty well connected on this basis in saying we enjoy this and it has put us on a new level. And from all the students participating in the importance of being earnest, come see our show. Thanks for listening to Spring River Chronicle, audio on the go. Be sure to subscribe to the paper and check us out online at myspringriver.com.